Uh, if you're new to my channel, this is a variety channel. It's educational. Sometimes it uses a little bit of humor, talks about politics, different things, sometimes somewhat controversial. Uh, if you're new, please consider subscribing and ringing the bell. At this time, there are no ads due to uh, YouTube's monetization policy, and they have told me I'm to figure out what I'm talking about that I should not be talking about. I still haven't figured it out. I can appeal. Thank you for stopping by. Now, today I'm going to talk about something that might be controversial. The Amish Hygiene Hypothesis. Now, I don't know if you've heard about this. In the United States of America and in some other countries, there are religious refugees that came here uh, many, many years ago, generations ago. Uh, they titled themselves Amish. They're from Germany, and uh, they, they call themselves Dutch sometimes. But the, they're European people that follow the scriptures of the Old and New Testament in a Protestant sect in a way where they shun a lot of modern conveniences that have developed over the years. And they uh, have uh, sex roles divided between male and female, binary. And uh, a lot of the things they do uh, re relies on old-fashioned, hard work, working sun up to sundown. But what they have found with these people is that they are great to study them because if they'll allow them to study... This is the thing, the Amish uh, do not allow cameras, and yet some people are taking photographs of them. They make all their clothes, they weave their cloth, and they uh, do everything from scratch. Now, it depends on the Amish sect, because some of the sects uh, do allow certain modern conveniences and man-made things. For example, look at this wagon. You know that wagon looks like a uh, store-bought wagon. Sometimes they sell their furniture, their baked goods, um, their dairy products, their produce in uh, local farm markets, and they gather up money that way. But why am I talking about the Amish and the hygiene hypothesis? Okay, so this is the thing. I disagree with the hygiene hypothesis that was given years ago, and I will tell you why I disagree with it. I disagree with it because what happens is people look at one piece and they eliminate all the confounding variables, which now they're reaching out to parasites and other things like that to say this is why the Amish are more robust and hardy and resilient to disease, asthma, and things like that. But they forget some confounding variables. And I'm going to tell you some of the confounding variables that they forget. But I'm going to show you a couple of studies. And I'm going to tell you uh, that this lifestyle that they have is conducive to wonderful health. They spend a lot of their time outdoors year-round. They go outside to get wood to keep warm. They're not allowed any electricity. Uh, and that is a key factor. Not allowed any electricity. Sometimes they have small amounts where they sneak a little here and there with batteries or they get some kind of generator for a, a, a ringer on the washer machine. I mean there's little loopholes in that. Okay so don't think it's one-size-fits-all and tenorally, totally generalizable, but I will tell you that these people are a tight-knit community, but they work hard, somewhat solo, on a lot of chores, day in and day out. Their educational levels tend to be about 8th grade. Uh, they're faith-based. They have strong faith. They have a lot of they're pacifists, okay? Their teachings of Jesus Christ, 
they do not do any surgeries uh, they don't they live heartily off the land now no computer no TV no electric lights no air conditioning no central heating etc but they have found ways to keep warm and live so they're basically rural Yemen farmers some of them have different areas like carpentry and whatnot they all pitch in together and build houses together they have holidays together they they every Sunday they have church together so let's read just a quick paragraph from this article I have the uh, reference to the article below it's by Dr. Lou MD and his opening paragraph in this study that he has it says the hygiene hypothesis describes the protective influence of microbe microbial exposures in early life on the development of allergy and asthma has continued to swell academic interest investigation and evolution and he's going on about the theory of the micro microbiome hypothesis now I want to tell you something right now what did they leave out of that hard vigorous labor exercise moving around fresh air sunshine no screen time no electrical magnetic frequency rays on them no radio waves no microwaves they're in the middle of nowhere or somewhere they're in God's country are they being exposed to electromagnetical frequencies okay so it's good to look at the microbiome the microbiome is one piece of the puzzle what about the hours of sunlight fresh natural vitamin D fresh air 78 percent nitrogen not a lot of synthetic fibers were breathing in did you know there's microscopic synthetic fibers floating around a lot of times in homes and viruses and things hitch rides on the dust and the viruses they work hard they clean their homes thoroughly but they might be using vinegar to clean with white vinegar instead of Clorox bleach they might be using salt or washing soda they might be making their own soap from scratch they might be using organic materials why am I telling you this because I'm working on a PhD and I've gotten through all but dissertation and I am seeing how narrow studies can be and how they leave out all these confounding variables and then they run with that hypothesis so I disagree with this hygiene hypothesis I think it's more about an entire lifestyle it's about the biochemical reactions in the human body to emotions yes emotions and stress the entire community is pacifist they must follow a strict code of loving one another now it is a hard life but it, it is a loving life it is loving nature it is loving one another it is being peaceful it is physical labor outdoors making things from scratch if you look at cultures like the blue zones where people live the longest let's look at some blue zones real quick I'm gonna get to this Robert O Becker in a minute if you look at longevity studies on blue zones these are areas where people live a long time and one thing I've noticed in these longevity studies and research that I've done on that is that these people live in areas where they cook their food from scratch they have a strong sense of community they have 
a high moral code about peace and love, look at Japan, look at sections of China, look at sections of, what's that island off of Italy? Um, gosh, I forgot its name. There's a Blue Zones. Um, they say a lot of it's uh, genetics, but I will tell you right now, every single one of them has, it's almost like it's you're going back in time. They like if you go to the blue zone, it's off of Italy. What is it called? Come on, help me out here. Um, it's an island. Blues. Blue zone off of Italy. It's an island. Sardinia. This is it. This is Sardinia. If you look at not just at at the people that live long, but if you look at their lifestyle, their entire day, it's not about sophisticated electronics. There's very little, there's no cell phones out there. There's no, hardly any electricity. They turn the lights off at night. They go to sleep at sundown. They get up at sunup. They have small farm animals. They make stuff from scratch. It's organic. And they work all day long making cheese from scratch and things like that. They're, they're, they're tending to animals. They're living a farmer type life. Now they don't shun electricity completely, but they use it very sparingly. And there's very little of it. And you can find this in all of the cultures that have less disease and they're like oh the Mediterranean diet oh well well these people are vegetarians over here the Seventh-day Adventists live longer well the Mormons don't drink coffee or alcohol all these things contribute but the sense of community the working from sun up to sundown the fresh air they're outside every single day they even get out and walk to church and back. And they study Bible together. And they know they can rely, if they have a problem in their family, they can rely on the community. There's a close-knit sense of community. And this is what is important. Your mental state, how you feel, fresh air, sunshine. If you're sitting inside all day reading books, and you're not getting outside at least one hour of sunshine a day. You're putting your health in peril. So I'm going to talk a bit about the uh, dental study. They did a couple of dental studies on them and they could not understand. They're not using fluoridated high dollar toothpaste. A lot of them don't even brush their teeth as much. And they found out that they have poor oral hygiene, they don't go to the dentist as often, yet for some reason uh, it says that they're, they've got many home remedies, it, they're, they don't have as many cavities, their teeth are stronger. Low levels of dental caries found in Amish children, and they're saying, well, maybe maybe it's not that they don't brush their teeth. Maybe it's that they're not allowed to snack. Well, what about the fresh air and the sunshine? What about the moving around? Exercise keeps your body flowing, your blood flowing. It's like stagnant chi energy. If you look into the energy studies, the body has electrical energies. It has flow going on in it. It needs energy from the sun as well. Now I'm going to scooch over here to this other book that I've been looking at besides um, the, the um, it's called, this is by an uh, OD uh, PhD. Uh, he has a, a, let me see, I get the book right next to me. Let me grab it for a second. Now I want to tell you, I want to preface this with the fact that I've noticed a lot of these doctors focus on one area of study and leave out a lot of other confounding variables. And this is the huge problem 
with all these, I got the solution. This Dr. Lieberman wants to have electrical light boxes, a red light for arthritis, a blue light for depression, you know, so, and, but he wants to generate it artificially in the lab, and he goes, since he's an eye doctor, he talks about the pineal gland, and he gets into alternative medicine, okay? And he writes this book, which is very interesting. It has a lot of good information in it. It's broken down for the layperson, but I'll tell you right now, it misses a lot of points. It misses the big picture. It, but it, 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 it talks about a lot of nuances that other physicians might be missing. You know, I remember going when I had a subacute endocarditis to the doctor. And he looked at me and he said, you're pale and uh, let's take your blood and let's, you know, I had to go to the cardiologist, get an echocardiogram and all this other stuff. And he's like, I want you to go outside and lay in the sun. You need to get some sun. This is what the physician told me. And um, I'm like, okay. So I went outside and I laid in the sun. I did what he told me to do. But is that something that a modern physician would tell you to do? I don't know. I talked to some other people and they laughed. But I was like, look, the doctor said I needed to get some sun, so I'm going to listen to him. I did get better eventually after six months on Bioxin and about biotics. But um, so... With the idea of light therapy, that right there, that was light therapy, and that was before they were recommending people get the vitamin D3 pill. Well, what's better, vitamin D3 captured in a pill, or are you going out and getting some fresh air and getting in the sun? What about the cofactors? Okay, so anyway, what I want to say about this book is that this doctor... Um, Lieberman has some great ideas, but it's not completely contextualized or refined enough for me, but it's got a lot of good information. It talks about color and uh, nature, syntonics, uh, UV that's good, UV that's bad. It goes on and on and on and on about it. What if you just go outside every day? What if you go to bed as soon as it gets dark and you wake up when it gets light? What if you don't snack between meals? <laughs> what if you avoid refined foods? What if you cook your food from scratch? What if you grow some of your food? Maybe we could learn something from the Amish. Okay, so what else do the Amish do? They're peaceful and loving. Well... Uh, so, and they they tend to have less asthma, less allergies, less dental uh, problems. And um, so the other thing I wanted to say real quick is that your mind and body are connected and that your emotions can affect your mood. Uh, I've, I've written on this. And there is a doctor, uh, Jan, who does wrote a book on psychoneuroimmunology. I had to take a class in immunology. And that's when it really came home. But before that, I took a class in neurology, uh, the brain and how uh, the brain is affected. It's a biochemical thing that's going on. So the light has electrical energy in it, too. And your, your body generates electricity. I've talked about these electromagnetic fields before, but um, there are people that are studying this, but we don't have it totally down. Now, because of the connection between electricity and your body, I wanted to learn more about electricity, and I started researching that. I watched a couple of documentaries, and I purchased this book on Amazon called The Invisible Rainbow. And I want to warn you about this book because if you don't have an, a, a, a good skeptic's mind or a good ability to discern or be able to 
digest and synthesize and tell what's biased and what's not and think about the big things like the big picture like the confounding variables and that's basically what's wrong with the the hygiene hypothesis you can kill off all the germs but you have good germs and bad germs you have symbiotic relationships right so the idea of the hygiene hypothesis is a good start. It's a piece of the puzzle, but I don't agree with it because it's too narrow in scope and it misses the hardy, robust lifestyle of the Am Amish as a factor and also their lack of modern conveniences. And what makes them resilient is that hard work. It's exercise. It's moving the body. It's out in the fresh air. It's out in the sunshine. It's out in the elements, but it's following the circadians of the weather and, and the rhythms of nature. If it's rainy all day, they're going to stay inside and they're going to be curling up in bed and they're going to be taking it easy on the rainy days. Or maybe they'll do some baking. They might go out for a minute to get some wood, but maybe they have a shed or they've built something uh, very, very ingenious, very in tune with nature. Go to sleep at night as soon as it gets dark. No more work. Everybody goes to bed. Say your prayers. Go to bed. Wake up in the morning. And then every day you're moving around. You're thinking. You're applying. You're eating some meals. They're hearty home from scratch meals. But, you know... It's a different way of life. And it's not just that they're very clean. Look, you can tell they wash their clothes by hand. They use uh, salts and homemade soaps. And, and they clean. They clean a lot. They're very clean, peaceful people. But they shun electricity. They shun automobiles. And um, so back to the... Uh, electromagnetic uh, field and the microwaves in the different fields of energy this is electricity puts off light okay it, if you've ever seen ball lightning it is a blue ball I've seen it twice in my life and um, so there's this energy around us right and this guy writes this book it's very long it's very thick it has a lot of references and it goes through the history of electricity but it says that humans just assumed it's relatively safe and it makes some statements in it that really upset me like it says something about cigarettes not being causing cancer as much as electricity totally unfounded not backed up by science there's no statistics describing the statements the author's making. It's almost like they're saying, you know, this is bad, black and white thinking. But the thing that's good about it is it's pointing out a lot. There's a lot of research in there, but it's conclusory. And it's biased. And I don't agree with everything it says. But it has a lot of good information, a lot of good references. It happens to have Dr. Becker in there. Who I'm going to get to now. Robert Otto Be Becker, MD, was uh, worked for the Veterans Administration. He was in the military. He worked in upstate New York. He got his MD through the military, uh, the Veterans Administration. And uh, later in his career, he worked on acupuncture and the electrical meridians that the ancient Chinese methods have. And uh, at one point, he did experiments, research on animals. There's a whole bunch of stuff on him. And I'm going to, but basically he got upset about the dangers of electricity in some of his studies. And he went to Congress to go down there and report on it. And he said, look, um, this is what we need to look at with electricity. Okay. So he was saying there's EMFs, electromagnetic fields. He went in October of 87 before Congress, and he gave them a speech, and then he went in 1990. Now, after that, his career went totally downhill. 
Now, a lot of the studies and research he did for the veterans or for the military or the United States government was involved in seeing the effect of electricity uh, and how electricity goes through the human body, what it does. To, but they, a lot of the experiments were on animals. So uh, they were finding that it was generating cancer as well as electricity. But you've got to look at things and look at the big picture. Look, vitamin D is very important. Getting sun is very important. Getting fresh air is very important. But you can die in the elements. You can die from too much sun. You can die from uh, too much outdoorsy because extremes in temperature. How long are you in that temperature? Uh, how long are you in the sun? Did you have enough water? So there's all these confounding variables. Okay, so that's what I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it at, and I'm gonna tell you that there's a lot more to the story than what a lot of these studies show. You need to look at all of the big big picture and also the little picture. You need to do the math. You case studies case studies are just that they're a case study, and one size does not fit all. So what do we know? We know that Amish people have a lifestyle that allows them to not get asthma and allergies as much at this time. Um, they have less cavities than most Americans. Why? They're moving around. Exercise is good for you. Use it or lose it. Use it or lose it. This is the way the human body works. You know, when I was nursing my children, I uh, joined a, an organization called the La Leche League. And what is the La Leche League? I don't know if this is the way we say it around here. And uh, it's an international organization. And um, they promote natural feeding of infants the way na nature uh, the, the way nature has it, but they also have a thing called milk banking. Sometimes uh, adoptive mothers want to have that closeness with their uh, baby, and quite frankly, you know, I don't, you know, what other people do. Sometimes women need money, and they'll pump extra milk. The thing is, the milk is tailored to the baby. But what I learned with feeding my baby is. If you have to go away and you freeze the milk in a little thing and you pump it, um, there's a thing called supply and demand. And if 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 you uh, if your baby's going through a growth spurt or they're getting sick, um, all of a sudden you're not having enough milk. It takes two to three days for your your milk supply to catch up. It's use it or lose it. So if you're not feeding or pumping, the body starts to produce less. If you're pumping more often between feedings, it's going to produce more, and a whole bunch of milk is going to come in. It's going to be p painful. You're going to be engorged, maybe, if you do too much. But the body works in a way like use it or lose it. Okay? It's like exercise, move it around. You might have... Uh, the body might have a physical reaction like engorgement or um, where your body starts uh, sending out um, the immune system starts pumping up and um, there's a sweet spot with exercise you can over train over exercise where it can actually uh, lower your immunity in, in other words you have to have a rhythm in your life now they have a rhythm in their life at sundown they go to bed and the thing is they start them young with these chores and physical activities young children are given small chores they can handle uh, they're given a bucket of grain to go feed the chickens they're you they're at first when they're three and four maybe they're with their mother the mother shows them how they have to lock the door so the chickens don't get out or whatever they're doing now, by the way, I, I'm not saying that I advocate eating uh, poultry, uh, chickens, or meat. 
no not at all this is just their lifestyle this is what they have to do it's not mine um, am I advocating no electricity at all no absolutely not I have electricity in my home so anyway the other thing is before I close that they have uh, so they're considered like if you're a health care provider they're considered a complex health patient because they don't believe completely in modern medicine is it in the Bible no it's not in the Bible uh, sh you know so um, most of them give birth at home and nurse their babies and they have compartmentalized work depending on the sex that you're born with and um, you know is it in the Bible so let's see here it says there are many factors that affect the health care of the Amish population. They have a table in here. You'll, I, by the way, the references are all below. You can get them on Google Scholar, except for the books, which I've already purchased. The Amish brought with them the old country that many home remedies and folk medicine. Some Amish still practice powwowing, also known as bracha or brachai, which is an old world brand of faith healing. The belief holds that certain people inherit or are endowed with a, a healing touch. They can move around a sick person and they can give off their uh, energy or through audible and silent incantations healing the person. Now one of the problems is that they're often preyed upon by quackery and fraud or medical exploitation. What does that mean? Well they only have like an eighth grade education they don't know how to discern between a chiropractor and an MD and a, a chiropractor can come up and start giving them medical advice or sell some pills that the chiropractors uh, you know the FDA does not regulate these homeopathic uh, medicines and a lot of homeopathy is a bunch of quack quackery no offense to any homeopaths out there but what I'm saying is that you know, there is a mind-body connection, and your emotions, there's a thing called the placebo effect, and so uh, one size doesn't fit all, but the body is the thing that really heals itself. And the doctor helps give the person the things that might help it heal. So, in the end, you know, there's, there's this factor out of control of the doctor, and that is the human will to live if you will or the faith the belief etc et and so there's a lot of other things that come into play and that's why uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about this Dr. O'Becker but I'm going to save that for next time and he also discusses acupuncture quite a bit in the meridians and he's saying that these meridians are spot on with the electrical currencies in the humans and humans all have electricity in them but we are uh, not shorting out or anything like that because we have this myelin sheath or this fatty sheath we have insulators in us and um, it's biochemical okay so we'll talk more about the Amish and electricity and health and hygiene in the next segment. Thank you for stopping by and listening. Uh, I appreciate each and every one of you. Put your comments in the box below. Take care. Bye.